Khalistanis in Canada and how they are how this topic today is at the foundation of that movement one of the most famous and uh, in the western world powerful sanskrit scholars sheldon pollock took this theory marxism 2.0 and applied it to interpret the whole history of india and sanskrit and our itihas and our uh, uh, shastras all of that and his theory was that the reason the masses of india did not revolt against this oppressive oppression by sanskrit sanskrit is an oppressive tool public did not revolt is because the uh, the brahmins and the rajas had a conspiracy to aestheticize their power make it look very pleasant big ram leela was a main interpretation of his that ram leela characterizes theater dance story in which everybody feels very proud and very empowered actually they are they they're making a fool of themselves because that is a conspiracy to keep them down they've done surveys according to which they are proving that uh, the caste bias in tech industry has entered america from india i i will call by people from microsoft that we were required by hr department to sit in a caste sensitivity training to sensitize us about the horrors of caste and it's very embarrassing that in front of our white colleagues we are being accused of all kind of things but the hr department said don't argue because then you'll be considered white racists so there are people calling me that you help us you tell us give us some answers so i started holding some private off the record little zoom calls tell people ke ye bolo wo bolo and that is how this book on varna jati caste came out to give them ammunition to say here are some talking points you can talk back here is so i i when i went to bay area in uh, november december time frame uh, some people in uh, google wanted to meet me off site have a lunch and a brainstorm outside their premises to tell me what's going on no cameras just tell me what's going on and some of them i've continued coaching and mentoring and to see you know what to how to answer because after all these people are worried about their visa being cancelled uh, they don't want to come they don't want the company to target them as that you are some kind of racist because the allegation being made is very powerful and very strong that indians are bringing a kind of an indian racism casteism kind of a thing to american society and we should stop it so there are even proposals that the h1b visa should have a caste quota so when you go to the us embassy us consulate uh, then one of the questions will be which caste are you and what religion and minority so you see all the masala all this weaponry uh, this is weaponizing the indian divisiveness this is why i call it breaking india 2.0 all the the breaking india forces now got the united states government because it's a democratic government it's got all these progressive sitting there uh, it, many indians in the democratic party are in fact believing in all this and promoting all this caste varna and jati as we all know has been a glorious obsession of the social sciences and this is happening from the beginning of social sciences in india we'll begin the uh, today's discussion uh, with a presentation on vokism and indian social sciences namaste and uh, thank you dr bajaj for organizing this and thank you kapil kapoor ji my mentor and uh, person with great influence on my career, life and thoughts and also thank you madhu a fellow warrior i would say uh, and thank you all of you the reason i find this uh, 
forum uh, particularly interesting is that uh, the social sciences in India has been a topic of my study from a critical point of view because it's all very Western, Marxist-oriented social sciences traditionally in India. And uh, the first step of fixing that problem because it's very skewed and it's certainly not been rooted in our own traditional approach to society. The first is the first step is to do a purva paksha, an evaluation and analysis of how these social sciences work. And I've been trying to do that for quite a while. And this uh, today's talk is also actually on that subject. So the Western Western social sciences based in Marxism have evolved to what I call Marxism 3.0. And I need to first explain what is Marxism 3.0, which is called critical race theory, and why it's important in American society, in academics, how it has already entered India, not will enter, how it has entered the industry, through their HR departments and their diversity, equity, inclusion programs, they're all based on that. Uh, in academics, uh, your Ashoka University, your uh, Kriya University, or all these kind of universities are really into this, that's the fashion of the day. Uh, government policy, a uh, lot of the people who are championing this in the US in places like Harvard are advisors in Niti Aayog. So, you know, it's not like I'm talking uh, some kind of an abstract theory which need not concern us. This is part of uh, how the machinery in this country is functioning. It's a new kind of colonization, I will explain. And yet, there's hardly been any discussion on it. One would think that something so important, you don't wait for uh, problems to become serious, you talk about it. But I haven't seen that happen, so I want to initiate that kind of discussion. Last night I had a dinner with Kapilji, and like all the dinners we've had, it was very insightful in the sense we have these real deep, lively discussion between the two of us. And the uh, in that discussion, when I started talking about the Khalistanis in Canada, and how they are, how this topic today is at the foundation of that movement. Then he said, make sure you explain that tomorrow. So I'm going to explain that uh, uh, here. I'm going to explain that. So you will understand that this uh, business of wokeism and critical race theory is not just some academic theoretical stuff. It's affecting our lives. It's uh, affecting the Dalit movement, where it has reached globally. Now it's called the Afro-Dalit movement. Uh, and it's uh, affecting, it has in fact, it's being marketed and propagated through the World Economic Forum through Harvard Kennedy School, where Indian bureaucrats are trained. In fact, I went to Harvard and gave a talk on my Snakes in the Ganga book. And the discussion in involved a lot of Indians studying at Harvard, funded by the Indian government, who made remarks, and this, this video is going to come out, who made remarks saying that what you're saying is not only true, but they're giving personal examples of how the very curriculum they are being taught funded by the Indian government, is all about anti-India. And, uh, and so this is a very strange kind of thing going on. You people have to know about it. So I will first give you a theoretical framework. Marxism originally was about economic oppressors and oppressed. A society can be divided according to Marxism into oppressors and oppressed, and therefore there is class warfare. But these... Uh, Oppressors and oppressed were economic classes. They were not divided by religion. They were not divided by race. They were not divided by caste. Marx was very clear. It was only economic. That, so that is, you may call it Marxism 1.0. And this idea that the, the, the oppressor's thesis, the, what, what runs society, uh, need to be countered with antithesis. And this is the dialectic. The antithesis will fight the thesis and there will be clash. It will be violent until both are dissolved and then some new thing will emerge out of that. So this continued until World War II when 
something known as the second wave, which I'm calling Marxism 2.0, but it's called the second wave, also called the Frankfurt School, started in Germany. And this is also called cultural Marxism. And the innovation was that the oppressor oppressed not it's not just owning means of economic production, who owns the farms, who owns the factories, which is what Marx originally talked about, but the means of cultural production, like who owns Hollywood, who owns uh, media, who owns education system, who owns theater, and so on. And this, this uh, Marxism 2.0 came up with this theory, which is a very impressive theory, very powerful theory. I've used it, quoted it in many of my books. The theory is called the aestheticization of politics, the aestheticization of power, meaning that uh, you keep your power, the oppressor keeps his power, by giving an aesthetic appeal to the oppressed. The oppressed feels so happy, patriotic, that we are this great people, we come from this great lineage, our history is grand, big parades, big museums, works of art, making the underclass, making the oppressed feel complacent. They don't have to, they, they feel there is no need to revolt because life is good. And uh, uh, this emotional, uh, emotionally uh, kind of, uh, uh, you know, satisfying the oppressed people emotionally, manipulating them emotionally to feel good. This business of feeling good, which politicians do, uh, and some big jatra and big parade and big pageantry, mela, tamasha, uh, sports game, you know, movie stars, all that uh, is a kind of what, what, he, what they call the aestheticization of power. And I started studying this because a famous, one of the most famous and in the Western world powerful Sanskrit scholars, Sheldon Pollock, took this theory, Marxism 2.0, and applied it to interpret the whole history of India and Sanskrit and our itihas and our uh, shastras, all of that. And his theory was that the reason the masses of India did not revolt against this oppressive oppression by Sanskrit, Sanskrit is an oppressive tool. The reason the, mark, the, uh, the public did not revolt is because the, uh, the Brahmins and the Rajas had a conspiracy to aestheticize their power, make it look very pleasant. Big Ram Leela was a main interpretation of his, that Ramlila characterizes theater, dance, story in which everybody feels very proud and very empowered. Actually, they are they're, they're making a fool of themselves because that is a conspiracy to keep them down, but to make them, give them a story of uh, their own greatness. So he interpreted all the Indian Shastras in that way. And his theory of uh, how, why Sanskrit flourished all over Asia and why Ram, Ramayana went all over Asia, basically in a nutshell, and he writes such complete convoluted language, all his books are five, six, seven hundred word uh, pages of very heavy Western terminology, which no Indian would understand. In fact, the research took me so long because I couldn't get any Indian Pandit or anybody of Sanskrit to help me figure out even one paragraph because people said it will take us two years to figure out one little part of it because it's written in very convoluted, heavy uh, Western jargon. But his theory was that the Brahmin and the Raja, the Brahmin and the Kshatriya king conspired such that uh, the Raja would become like Ram, Ram. The Brahmin would make him Lord Ram in, on earth. He is the Raja, he is the, uh, the, the, the Lord has come as the king. And this, this pageantry of uh, aesthetics would be so appealing to the public that they wouldn't want to revolt. They would all feel so proud of it. So this is Marxism 2.0. Now comes Marxism 3.0, which is uh, the people from this Frankfurt School after World War II came to the United States. This is so interesting a story because you hardly think America would be Marxist because it stayed in the, uh, in the ivory towers of academics for several decades. But when they came to the United States and they were bringing their Marxism 2.0, they couldn't uh, get much uh, you know, traction until this fellow, Herbert Marcuse, young man at the time, he, in Berkeley, he developed this theory that you know, uh, Marxism 1.0 was economic 
based and 2.0 is based on uh, cultural empowerment and disempowerment and so on and uh, and uh, aestheticizing people you know he came up with a new idea that was race because he said in america it has to be race so he said the marxism now should be about whites oppressing blacks so it's a race mass marxism 3.0 now it remained very sort of uh, uh, basic uh, not mainstream uh, until a harvard professor created what he named critical legal theory at harvard which uh, became a big thing and then his students and followers and other people after him developed it further and that became known as critical race theory and basically critical race theory says that uh, all the structures of society uh, all the social structures of that exist were made by elitists who are the oppressors so the economic structures were made by economic oppressors which is what marxism 1.0 says you should overthrow and the cultural structures of education and religious churches and and the art and drama and pageantry and sports and all of the rhetoric all the public discourse all the narratives are made by you know people with cultural oppression and so that is marxism 2.0 and then the marxism 3.0 said that the structures of in the united states are made by white supremacists white people who were slave owners and so these structures have to be demolished is what uh, what they were saying so um critical race theory therefore espouses that the only justice possible is by dismantling all the structures of society because they are tainted by uh, supremacy uh, and 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 so on and so now this also remained very uh, limited in its appeal in the academic world only until the tragedy of george floyd who got killed by white police people in a very brutal way and the emotions are all aroused and we, uh, i was also one of the followers and believers in black lives matter i still believe in that uh, however when the emotions of black lives matter became very high then the proponents of critical race theory figured is their opportunity to go mainstream so that is when critical race theory in recent years became mainstream big way and became uh, su- a subject taught in schools taught in colleges and uh, so it's a very recent phenomenon to go mainstream but the theory has been around for several decades now that is marxism 3.0 so one of the things it does is it has a category called protected classes protected classes is in the united states law and in the canadian law it's a term used to like you have scst kind of thing they have a term called protected classes which means any oppressed people any identity that is oppressed are entitled to certain privileges and they cannot be touched they have entitlement in the sense that one of the one of the privileges of the protected class is that they can practice what is called cancel culture so if they say if i am protected class my it has been designated i am on the list of protected class in the government you know records they've classified me as such then i can cancel you if you are the oppressor if i designate you as the oppressor it's up to me to designate you as the oppressor and then i can say you're not allowed to speak and if you speak you thrown out this is called cancel culture and is very official in their world it is not something wrong they are doing by canceling me because i am part of the oppressor according to them that's that's how cancel culture works so this this is this has consequences now comes marxism 4.0 so marxism 4.0 is an indian innovation that is dalit scholars under guys like suraj jengde suraj jengde uh, see there were kanchal ayar type people in india uh, doing it in indian context but suraj jengde is this very charismatic dynamic fellow at the harvard kennedy school he calls himself afro dalit and he came up with the innovation that he'll make alliances with the blacks and say that blacks and dalits are one and and he's got this afro hairstyle and he's, he's he says i'm black man and he talks like that behaves like that and he hobnobs with some of the leading black scholars at harvard so it is dalit black bhai bhai 
unity and we are the oppressed. So he is using critical race theory and Black Lives Matter as his uh, bandwagon on which to jump the whole Dalit movement and use Harvard and United States, uh, their idea of protected classes and say, okay, Dalits are also protected, protected classes. So this, this is why it is relevant to India. Because now all this thing, whether it is attack on Adani or Modi or this thing or that thing or Khalistanis, I'll come to Khalistanis in a moment. Uh, it is riding on this bandwagon that uh, in the United States, it starts in the United States, but then it's being exported here. It's being exported by people like Microsoft, people like uh, Cisco, people like uh, Apple, people like uh, Google. And I will tell you all that. And the corporate India is bought into this. I will tell you this, 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 these facts. So the, uh, to go through systematically, the, uh, the Marxism 4.0 is now called critical caste theory. There's critical race theory, which is American. That's an American thing. And maybe many of us are sympathetic with it because blacks have suffered. Whites have done those kind of things. But now when you go from 3.0 to 4.0, you bring it into Indian context. That's a different game. So I, a lot of my, a lot of Indians in the United States tell me, Are, bhai, no, no, we, are, we are supporting the blacks. Why are you all doing all these black, whites have done bad things? I say, okay, but now, now it's Marxism 4.0 because now you are saying critical caste theory and critical caste theory says Dalits are the oppressed and non-Dalits are the oppressor and the whole business of whites oppressing blacks is now brought into India and they are saying Dalits are the blacks of India. Now those of you who read my book Breaking India a dozen years ago, I wrote about Afro-Dalits at that time. Because that movement was just starting, it had not gone mainstream. I wrote about the, there are a lot of sections and chapters where you are Afro-Dalit is discussed. And in fact, the whole book came about when an African, African-American scholar at Princeton University met me at a restaurant, we we're having lunch. And he said he's just come back from India where he's part of the Afro-Dalit movement. And I had never heard of such a thing. So for a dozen years or more, I have been talking about it in India. The book, uh, Breaking India, became a bestseller. But the people in India, the social scientists and the government policy makers and the intellectuals did not take this seriously. So now this Afro-Dalit has become a very, very big deal. And Harvard is pushing it. It's in their curriculum. It's in their... And these guys are... And the worst part is, I will talk about it, Indian billionaires like Lakshmi Mittal, like Ananda Mahindra, like Pira Mal, these kind of people are funding it at Harvard. This is very strange. Why are they funding it? What's in it for them? This is very strange. But that's what's happening. So now this Marxism 4.0, critical caste theory, has someone like Suraj Yengde, very young, charismatic fellow. Of, he's, he calls himself the Ambedkar. He says he's finishing what Ambedkar started. So it's interesting we are in the Ambedkar auditorium. And uh, uh, I've written in my book, a uh, whole chapter is on uh, my analysis of Ambedkar, by the way. You should read that. And I'm happy to debate with Ambedkar, right? My analysis of Ambedkar. And then my analysis of Yengde claiming to be the new Ambedkar, whether that can be <laughs> genuine or not. So there's a lot of mistranslations and manipulations everywhere uh, to make it fit the new theory. Now, somebody called uh, Ajanta Subramaniam at Harvard, a professor, uh, started attacking IITs as oppressors using this theory to, on IITs. So we've written a book called The Battle for IITs on this very topic. It's also available. And the battle for IITs is Harvard people saying that IITs were created by Brahmins or for Brahmins, whatever, to oppress Dalits. So this whole structure of oppressor oppressed in the Indian context, in the Dalit, non-Dalit context, has been, is, is the great example they've given is that IITs are a culprit an example of the culprit and all these IIT people are all over the world and they are becoming very rich, they are becoming very powerful so they name all the IIT and who are successful in Silicon Valley and they name them in, in their research and they say they are all part of the oppressors and things like that. So that another thing Harvard has produced and it's part of their syllabus, they're part of their curriculum and they're having conferences and they talk about it and when they talk about it the director proudly calling himself director of Mahindra Humanity Center is in charge and introduces them. What a strange thing. 
What a strange thing. You see, so I'm, I know I'm in trouble with all kind of people. So now it is the Indian billionaires also on the list of uh, people that we have criticized because, but we invite them to come and explain why are they doing all this. So then a comp an organization called Equality Labs, funded by some George Soros type people and Omidyar type people, all these kind of people are also involved in that. They are run by an Indian called Sondarya Rajan, whom I've had some encounters with. On YouTube, you'll see some of my encounters. They claim that they did research in Silicon Valley and various wherever Indian IT workers are present in large numbers, they've done surveys according to which they're proving that uh, the caste bias in tech industry has entered America from India. And uh, these uh, Silicon Valley people, all are senior guys, and they name, uh, you know, Sundar Pichai and they name all these kind of people and say they're all oppressors, they're all Brahmins. And uh, the Dalits are being given low-level jobs and they're biased against them. And she produced all this stuff and they started giving workshops. One of the workshops they gave at World Bank, World Bank, recently. And uh, we have a video which will come out in the next week or two by an Indian at the World Bank in a very senior capacity who was invited to this caste sensitivity workshop to uh, by this uh, uh, these pe same pe people they are going around they are giving workshops in microsoft they are giving workshops all over silicon valley and they've gone to united nations to give a workshop and they've given a workshop in world bank the implication being that if caste is a category of bias and prejudice then under international laws when you give a world bank grant when you give a world bank loan one of the things you should ask for is how many Dalits are going to be working, how many Brahmins are going to be working, how many minorities are going to be working, is this, are they hiring enough Muslims? So this whole thing is coming now through World Bank also and through United Nations also and you better know about it. You cannot be sleeping and saying, oh, hey, kya humko nahi tha. because you have to know how to connect the dots starting with a theoretical framework, which is what I'm explaining to you. If you understand the framework, you know how to connect the dots. If you don't understand the framework, you'll be asking questions like, Are bhai, ya, wo ye kar rahe hai? why are they doing this? doesn't make any sense. And that's the reactive. Reacting to one episode at a time is what our people have been doing. Our media people, our intellectual people, because they have not gone into the framework, which is what this book, Snakes in the Ganga, is. The reason it's a big book is because it explains the framework. So now, this, this organization called Equality Labs, run by Sondere Rajan, going around uh, giving workshops, files a lawsuit against a company called Cisco, which is a very big tech company in our highest tens of thousands of Indians. And the s lawsuit says that there is Brahmin in Cisco, an employee, senior management, who is oppressing Dalit in Cisco. So now it has entered the American corporate world. And it has consequences. So now this is, of course, shaken up Cisco. Of course, they have to defend it. This friend, this person uh, whom I know, I've talked to him privately, the Brahmin who's being accused. Um, I mean, he's got nothing to do with this oppression business. He's not, he's in fact declared himself long, decade before all this happened as an atheist. He doesn't even practice anything. But he, it's a good target to get try and extort some money out of some rich Silicon Valley company, basically. So you see, uh, Sundara Rajan has become a very big name radical in the United States, uh, basically going to all these Silicon Valley companies, threatening them that, you know, you will be in trouble. You are Microsoft. Do you know you have a problem? I, we will do research. We will investigate. We will check out and we will give you a report and we'll tell you how to fix it. So they're off. They're charging as much as $75,000 per hour for consulting. I mean, this is a good business. $75,000 per hour for doing their consulting and their workshop and so on. So I've had people call me. You know, our people are scared. Our, the people who are vulnerable are the low, middle level tech workers. Sundar Pachai is a billionaire. He's not bothered. He, he's, they are safe. They will follow whatever the corporate requirement is because they're aligned with the corporate. But the workers, I, I will call by people from Microsoft that we were required by HR department to sit in a caste sensitivity training 
to sensitize us about the horrors of caste. And it's very embarrassing that in front of our white colleagues, we are being accused of all kind of things. But the HR department said, don't argue, because then you'll be considered white racists. So these are people calling me, that you help us, you tell us, give us some answers. So I started holding some private, off the record, little Zoom calls, to tell people, ke ye bolo, wo bolo. And that is how this book on Varna Jati caste came out, to give them ammunition to say, here are some talking points, you can talk back. Here is, so I, I, when I went to Bay Area in uh, November, December time frame, uh, some people in uh, Google wanted to meet me off-site, have a lunch and a brainstorm outside their premises to tell me what's going on. No cameras, just tell me what's going on and some of them I've continued coaching and mentoring and to see, you know, what to, how to answer. Because after all, these people are worried about their visa being cancelled. Uh, they don't want to come, they don't want the company to target them as that you are some kind of racist. Because the allegation being made is very powerful and very strong that Indians are bringing a kind of an Indian racism, casteism kind of a thing to American society and we should stop it. So there are even proposals that the H-1B visa should have a caste quota. So when you go to the U.S. Embassy, U.S. Consulate, uh, then one of the questions will be, which caste are you and what religion and minority? So you see all the masala, all this weaponry, uh, this is weaponizing the Indian divisiveness. This is why I call it Breaking India 2.0. All the, the Breaking India forces now got the United States government, because it's a democratic government, it's got all these progressives sitting there. Uh, it, many Indians in the Democratic Party are in fact believing in all this and promoting all this. This is true. And uh, I've been a Democrat most of my life, funded them, supported them and all that. But now recently, I, a lot of people are feel, finding that there's a crisis, uh, that this has gone too far. Because they really don't understand Indian society, and they, yes, yet they are making all these policies, foreign policies. That is why their uh, Secretary of State comes and talks about, you know, you're violating human rights and our Jay Shankar has to respond. But Jay Shankar doesn't know what the underlying problem. You see, this is why I, I brought in the Indian um, consulate people. They come in. Uh, recently, the Indian consul general of New York came and praised me and in a big event uh, done for my work in New Jersey, he came. But while publicly they're praising all this, they're not following the message. It's not so important to praise me. It, that's ir irrelevant. But the message I'm giving, the Ministry of External Affairs has not yet understood it. Because they don't know that this is the uh, the reason Jay Shankar has to defend India so many times against these allegations of, that you are not a democracy, uh, you are this and that. It, the underlying root cause they have not understood. It comes from critical race theory, and this critical race theory has turned into critical caste theory. And the center of this whole nexus is Harvard University. And guess what? Indian billionaires are funding it. This is a very serious matter. At the very least, the social science people in this country should be making noise. Saying, what is this going on? So this is why I decided that uh, that I'll uh, I'll come here and give this talk. Uh, this uh, uh, this business about um, uh, uh, laws in the U.S. being changed has taken a new level. Many universities, starting with Harvard and many others following, have declared officially that caste is a form of racism. And therefore comes uh, uh, under the category of protected classes, protected classes, and comes under the category of all the race laws. Which means that if you are in the university and some professor and you are accused of, uh, hey, you are you're Brahmin and all that, you have to be on the defensive. You, you better, not, uh, uh, better not give a proper response because you'll be considered a person who's in denial. There is this theory. In, uh, in critical race theory that says the supremacists are in denial. Part of their power comes from the fact that it is invisible, it is under the surface, it's very quietly being done, and they can deny it. They can say, I don't know what you're talking about, and they can deny their oppression because it's done through structures that are very invisible in society. So now that we are told Indian society is, is subject to the same thing, and this has now become part of laws in the United States. Some universities have enacted it. In California, uh, some of the counties, the county where Silicon Valley is, has made a county resolution 
the county level people have made a resolution that uh, caste is a form of racism. It's a part of that. And now there is a debate in Seattle. The, it will be the first big municipality, Seattle, where Microsoft is headquartered and many other companies. That uh, there's an Indian woman who has come up with a resolution before the city council to condemn this caste as a form of Indian racism. It mentions in particular that it's for all over the world, all these problems are all over the world, but uh, the, she names Dalits, Brahmins, these kind of things specifically coming out of India as the problem for all this. So you see, it's put Indians on the back foot. Uh, and uh, so I, one of my jobs has been to go and wake up the IIT people. The, this attack is on you. I'm not an IIT and attack is on you. You should defend yourself. If you don't want to defend yourself, at least support us because we're defending you. I'm sticking my neck out for your sake. I'm not getting anything out of it. I don't need to get anything out of it. I'm secure and safe. I don't care. But I'm doing it as a matter of principle to protect you and the young people who can't speak up for themselves. And so at the very least, you should give me moral support. So I'm glad to say that the book Battle for IITs, on the back you will see a very powerful endorsement by Ron Gupta, who is the president of Pan IIT USA. That's the international organization of the IIT alumni. So they are beginning to wake up. Uh, I've had a lot of discussion on this with faculty in IIT Madras. Uh, I'm going to have it with IIT Kanpur. We are going there in a week. Uh, we are going to go to IIT Bombay. So the IITians in India, and the uh, uh, alumni in the United States are being woken up. But you know, this has been going on for 10 years. Uh, Ajanta Subramaniam and these other people, they've been writing uh, articles and finally culminated in a book. And finally the book becomes a bestseller and then finally it enters the mainstream curriculum. But all of this starts 10 years ago. So the, the IITians were sleeping. They, were not, they did not nip it in the bud at that point in time. This is a, a, a huge topic that, uh, you know, we can go on. Uh, I mean, I just wanted to give you enough provocation. And this book is basically giving a rejoinder to the theory that uh, caste is racism. And this whole critical caste, uh, critical race theory, critical caste theory, which is now popularly called wokeism. Wokeism is the popular term for this whole Marxism 3.0, Marxism 4.0. That is more of an academic. What I gave you is more of an academic discourse uh, for serious scholars to understand these kind of things. But the popular level talk uh, among African Americans and Dalit, Afro-Dalit people and all is called wokeism. And wokeism has entered India in a big way. You see this Suraj Jengde is big celebrity in all this uh, Jaipur Literary Festival and all these kind of places. Uh, and, and you'll see, now how has it entered corporate India? Let me tell you. Corp there is something called ESG, where E stands for environmentalism, S stands for social justice, G stands for good governance, which is, looks fine to us. And uh, people like Ernst & Young, Deloitte, McKinsey, all these American uh, consulting companies are coming to uh, Reliance and Tata's and all these corporate people and saying we will do an audit and tell you what is your ESG rating. Because depending on your ESG rating, you will be getting funding or not getting funding. Uh, you go online and look at uh, uh, investments. Uh, globally, people are investing billions, trillions of dollars in all the companies around the world. And one of the criteria is what is your ESG rating? Because if your ESG rating is low, and now they have lowered Adani's ESG rating. Uh, ESG rating low means you are not a responsible company in terms of social justice. So then you start zooming in on what is meant by social justice. This is why I wanted the social justice ministry to be present here, and they're not. I hope they, one day I get a chance to talk to them about this. So the social justice movement in the uh, corporate world is called DEI, diversity, equity, inclusion. Now, words are very nice. Sometimes you use beautiful words, but you don't know what they mean, and so you support it. So diversity means, you know, you want diversity. Equity is a very important term that you should understand. Equity is not equality. Equality means equal opportunities. Everybody is equal in their opportunities. Some who work harder will come ahead. Equity does not want that. Equity means that the outcome should be com com commensurate 
with the percentage of population of different groups. So it is identity allocation, quota. Equity means Harvard wants to admit students not on merit, but on uh, equity so that a certain percentage of seats should be for this group, that group, that group, that group, that group. Asians are three, four or five percent of the U.S. population, Asians. On merit, Harvard's own report says on merit, Asians would occupy 43 percent of all the seats on merit. 43 percent if they looked at scores and they looked at whatever the objective criteria are. Based on meritocracy, Asians would get 43 percent of all the seats but they're only four, five, five percent of the population. So they have artificially put a cap on how many Asians. And this is in the Supreme Court, this case is, US Supreme Court is hearing this case. And by summer, they will have a ruling on this. So everybody's wondering what will happen. So this business of increasing the quotas of certain communities, decreasing the quota of certain communities. And now, now it will be not just Asians, now it will be Brahmins. And Dalits, Dalits will be in the Afro-Dalit quota. So this is a very interesting thing going on, that the whole uh, system uh, being, uh, being uh, manipulated in this way. Uh, so this DEI in the corporate world is being administered by the HR departments. The human resource department in the corporate world are being trained and given certifications by people at Harvard and others in India trained by them according to their methodology of how you certify a DEI officer. I know friends who are Indians, good friends, who are DEI officers in some very, very big companies. They're very proud of that. They get make a lot of money. They're doing very well. But it's difficult to convince them that what they're promoting in the name of equity rather than equality is a serious problem. The people who are at the center of all this, Harvard, different departments in Harvard, Harvard Kennedy School, that is the largest and most powerful political thought uh, and leadership training in the world. They train the future prime ministers and presidents and their sons and daughters and the military chiefs and all these, they bring all these kind of people. Indian government has a program with Harvard Kennedy School where bureaucrats are sent, uh, they pay a huge tuition, a living expense to get them trained and come back and these guys get brainwashed. And I have it on record from these people themselves saying that this is what they're doing to us. One guy says, he, uh, I'm going to put this uh, video out in the next week or two. Uh, he says that uh, in class when they're talking about India, uh, those who raise a hand who are going to criticize and knock down India get uh, more time. And if I stand up and uh, defend and give a counter argument, then uh, I will not be acknowledged next. They just cancel me, kind of. These are Indian people saying. And then when you ask them, but you are getting the money from the government, why government sending you? Why is government sending you? Then nobody knows why the government sending people to a place like that. China sends its people also. China chair, uh, funds a lot of chairs, but they put conditions. They do not want Harvard to teach them about Chinese history, Chinese human rights, Chinese social justice, Chinese politics, Chinese you know democracy, lack of democracy. They are saying they send their people to, for training on things like STEM, science, technology, engineering, medicine, bring tech, bring intellectual property back, which China needs how to make rockets and how to make uh, you know jet engines and how to uh, make quantum computing and artificial intelligence that is good for china they want to go send their people to the best universities bring this knowledge back even if they have to steal they'll steal also a lot of intellectual property bring it back they encourage those people but they are not there to study Chinese history. They are saying it is not a Harvard's business to teach us our own history. We know what we want to teach you, none of your business. In India, it's the other way around. A very large percent of the Indian students who go are studying Indian history, sitting in Princeton University or Harvard University, studying Indian history, studying Indian social justice, studying in what is wrong with India. All these conferences on uh, India conference in Harvard is full of, uh, they bring all these kind of activists, Altu Faltu people from India, they are brought there, they're encouraged. All the fellows that you people are fighting here in India are encouraged there. And the strangest part is that Indian billionaires are funding it. Why are they funding it? This is such a big problem. Ekto, they are funding in Harvard, this kind of a thing. Secondly, they are bringing this DEI, diversity, equity, inclusion, in the HR department in India itself. Third thing that is happening is that under pressure from this equality labs and these kind of people, places like 
Microsoft and uh, Facebook and uh, you know uh, uh, the Amazon and all that are uh, doing diverse this uh, uh, cost training, cost sensitivity training to their top management. And the HR department in these in the uh, U.S. are now asking the HR departments of their Indian subsidiaries. So Microsoft India, Google India, Facebook India, Apple India, Amazon India. They're telling those guys in India that, hey, listen, you have to start becoming caste sensitive because we want to export the same ideology to you. So this critical race theory and critical caste theory is coming into Indian tech industry. So I'm telling this uh, tech people, hey, bhaiya, you want, don't even don't have time to listen to me. Yeah, because they're all busy about you export hora, wo hora, flana, and all that. Until they're hit with the somebody hit their head, they will not wake up, and they're waiting to be attacked rather than nipping it in the bud. Nobody has stood up and said that the Indian HR should be has its own Indian policies. HR departments should have their own Indian policies. We should have our own Indian culturally sensitive policies and not bring American racism into our industry. Nobody has said that. So not only is are the American tech companies going to export it to their subsidiaries in India, but also the outsourcing companies that they from whom they buy services. So if Tata Consultancy uh, buy, sells a lot of services, tech services, they will be under uh, this US uh, labor. These are labor laws. These are going to become, gradually, they are going to become laws of the United States ex for worldwide. Like there are laws in the United States that if you buy... Uh, if you buy outsourcing manufacturing or s services or whatever from another country, there are certain uh, human rights that you have to respect even in those countries. And your ESG rating as a company will go down if you are outsourcing from a slave farm, for example, or if you are outsourcing from a place that is uh, creating pollution, although they do that, but they have to fudge it somehow. Officially, if an American company is attacked, that your subsidiary in such and such country is violating the American way of life and thinking and ideology, they will be in trouble. The ratings will go down. So under the fear of that, these American companies are going to start doing it in India. Not only tech companies, pharmaceutical companies, automobile, every export sector in India will be affected. Every export sector in India will be affected by what is equivalent to minority quotas, caste quotas, this and that quotas, and guess who are the DEI officers? The DEI officers are the people being certified by these certification authorities. It is not somebody that uh, ICSSR has come up with a curriculum of here's how DEI should work because we are the keepers of social just social sciences. It is not like that. I would want to work with ICSSR and come up with counter arguments to proactively prevent all that from happening and spreading all over India and give counter proposals. But we need uh, traction. We need uh, somebody here who want to work with us. We can't just go on lecturing, writing books, and nothing's going to happen with that. So you see, India is for sale. India is for sale by its own people, by the corporate elites. I am going to Bombay to face, you know. I have, in fact, invited all these guys. Nobody, not one has accepted the invite. I am saying we are not accusing you. We are just asking questions. Maybe there is a good reason for doing it, but we would like to know. Maybe you should put pressure on Harvard to change their policy because you are giving them money. You should have some say. After all, China does that. There is no Chinese funding that is any linked with, uh, uh, you know, something in Harvard going on that talks about the rights of Uyghur Muslims being violated or Tibetans being violated or lack of democracy in Hong Kong. Those are topics off the record, not allowed. Harvard listens because money talks. The Chinese government know what to ask for. And they're all together in this. The Chinese industrialists and their, uh, their, uh, in, uh, their government and their students are aligned. They're patriotic first. And they're not uh, everybody looking out for his own personal self-interest, like the Indian people tend to be. So this is, a, this is an issue. So I, I feel that uh, um, our job has been to do this research, get out of our comfort zone, face the bullets, because these bullets are coming for, uh, for us from all directions. You can see how many people would be attacking me. Uh, in the U.S. because I've taken this on and, uh, you know, but I've been doing this for like 30 years now. 
but this is the latest. This fight has gone to an, another level now. And now it is the Harvard type people also, you know. And now it is the Indian billionaires that we are taking on, the Indian mainstream media. And you know, a lot of the Harvard people that we have named as problems are on the, some Niti Aayog advisory role here and there, you know. So this is, this is a cancer that has spread. This is a cancer that has spread and, uh, and it is, uh, it is uh, uh, unclear whether something can be done about it. Uh, uh, but at the very least, uh, Indian authorities need to be alert to this. Uh, this is a national security issue because if Breaking India 1.0 be later became recognized as a security issue which everybody talks about, then this is a Breaking India 2.0. And I have not even mentioned today, because we don't have the time for that, but I have not even mentioned the role of uh, technology, artificial intelligence, and big data, and surveillance. All that is happening, making this even worse, because those are weapons to monitor, the weapons to rate people. You know, there is an artificial intelligence uh, service which says that to, as part of the ESG rating, which means how much social justice you have in your company, they are going. They are doing uh, facial recognition, so th they can recognize you in all the pictures, photographs, videos, wherever they appear. So they can, for instance, uh, look at all the pictures of, say, Mukesh Ambani, and figure out when is he shaking hands with the Dalit, and when is he shaking hands with the minority person, and when is he shaking hands with the Brahmin. And when he's shaking hand with somebody, so and then they can rate and say, you know, 80% of the time he's shaking hand with other big people, and only 20% with Dalit, and he's more uh, interested in this group and that group. And when he's shaking hand with those people, he's smiling. With those people, he's not smiling. So this is all nonsense. This is all artificial intelligence able to do uh, what would take lakhs and lakhs of human beings to do. And these are how the ratings are going to be done. So the whole business of ratings. This whole rating, these indexes, the index for this, the index for that, the index for that, are instruments for colonizing because you have to go and get your index rating better in order to be recognized internationally, to get money, to get funding. And in order to improve your index, who is going to tell you what to do? Well, it's the American consulting company. So these Ernst and Young, all these American consulting companies from McKinsey and uh, all these uh, the big global chartered accountancy type people are part of this. They're, they are trained uh, to, uh, with certain uh, criteria. Now, you know, in the US, I will say one thing, that there are also counter movements, which there aren't in India. In the US, people in artificial intelligence have started AI and ethics, AI, responsible AI, AI and faith. These kind of groups are starting. And many of them invited me to be on their board. And I've started serving on some of these boards to learn what's going on. So one of the, one of the big movements which Microsoft is championing and many of them are championing is that they want to have, they want to take their own employees and ask them to give feedback on whether or not our AI is being ethical and whether our AI is biased. And since they have people from all the cultures and all the religions, they want them to give feedback. But guess what? The Christians are highly organized in these companies. They have official groups that the company recognizes. There's a Christian group in Microsoft. There's a Muslim group in Microsoft. There's a Jewish group in Microsoft. I, the Hindu group call me and tell me that we are not interested in our Jo interested and privately interested hai, they don't want to show their face, they don't want to make it public, they're not assertive, and they don't have the knowledge, they don't even know how to argue because they're scared, and they don't have, they're ignorant because they don't, were not taught these things in India. So they only know how to write software and all that, but they don't want to rock the boat and face these consequences. So what is happening is our culture, civilization, faith, etc., are underrepresented, if, if represented at all in many of these forums. And I'm, I'm, I can't one man be countering all that. And I, can't, I don't have 1,000 hours a day to go running around and responding to everything. But so much demand coming for getting involved, get into this Zoom call, go fly here, go there, go attend this meeting because we have nobody to represent us. I've gone to the gurus and they don't know one darn thing about it. 
our gurus don't know one darn thing about either this critical caste theory business and they don't want to take on this controversy and they know nothing about this AI. And yet the global establishment say, yeah, we went to so-and-so guru and so-and-so guru and this is what he had to say and he doesn't have to say anything. So who speaks for us? Who speaks for us? Industry has sold out. Okay, the gurus are not participating in all this. They unki dukan chal rahi hai. They don't want to <laughs> mess with it. They don't want to go into all these things. They're too controversial. It's over their head. Government is not doing anything about it. Ministry of External Affairs no, doesn't know much about it. Who are going to do about it? So this is a this is a very serious problem, and this is social sciences problem, and that's why I'm very glad that I'm here, uh, being hosted by ICSSR because first step is to build awareness, to build awareness. And, uh, and I'm here for a month and I'm happy to go talk to whoever you guys want me to talk to. I was here three, four months ago, spent five weeks running around giving talks. So, and they have sympathy also. But one needs to take it beyond just verbal stuff and turn it into policy. India needs policy on how to attack these kind of uh, global, uh, global uh, you know, tsunamis that are coming. We need policy, uh, and, and and it cannot be that we are we are very abstract. We are on an abstract level. We are Vishwa Guru, but we are Vishwa Chelas because we are following. We are Vishwa Chelas, Vish, Vishwa Kulis, in some ways. Kuli, our, our, our tech workers telling me that you know we are doing all the dirty work, running around, but the intellectual property belongs to Microsoft, not to the Indians even though Indians producing much of the work. We are very proud that NASA mein itne sare hain log. We keep hearing that. So, but that means we are just supplying them the labor. The rocket is unique. The technology is theirs. The patents are theirs. They do not belong to us. So what if our people are working there? I mean, Bihar supplies a lot of brick, brick layers and masons and uh, plumbers and to Delhi and they come and do construction. But the Bihari worker is not the guy who owns anything. He just makes money, sends money home, and uh, then he goes to the next job. So our tech workers are like that. They are just migrant workers hopping from job to job, collecting money, sending money back home. But they don't own a, one line of code that they've written. They may have written million lines of code, but they don't have right to any even one of them. And nor, so indeed, it is not a, a matter of pride that uh, we are training the world's largest artificial intelligence workforce. The point is we are training it to be rented to somebody else. So you see, we got serious issues as a nation that are not being discussed adequately in our manthans, in our literary festivals, uh, in the parliament, uh, in the think tanks. Uh, Nitya Yog didn't want anything to do with me. I, we went and uh, Rakesh ji tried to get a talk, a talk, my talk organized, and they all kind of reason, hey, ha, ho, karke. Uh, so, because I am very forthright and I have written my, this is my position. Why Mr. So-and-so, so-and-so and so-and-so on your advisory board, I'd like to discuss what is their role, why are they here, have you done enough pariksha, enough due diligence on their background and what they are doing in their work before bringing them into this consulting role. Because India has been infiltrated by all sorts of these kind of people. So thank you very much for inviting me and thank you for listening. Namaste. Thank you, Mulhotraji. He has given us a very uh, wide overview of the evolution of wokeism and through different stages and uh, how it has begun to impact uh, uh, India now in a very serious and perhaps very dangerous manner and why we should be very careful and worried about it. <laughs>